In this example, we're told that the height of the free surface in a tank of fluid with diameter D um, is, is changing because it's draining fluid through a small hole at the bottom with the diameter little d. So basically the picture is this down here. We have this big tank. Cap, uh, capital D is the diameter of the tank. Capital H is the initial height of fluid in the tank. And then it's draining through the small hole diameter little d because of gravity. And over time then the free surface of the fluid in the tank is decreasing. And we have our prototype which is given, um, well, we're, we have a prototype device and then we're also making a half scale model. So the, the prototype tank, the dimensions are given up here and then half scale model, basically you divide all of these things by two. And we gather some experimental data, which is given right here. So here's the data from the prototype. So at different times, we measure the height of the free surface over here. And then we do the same thing for the model. So at different times in the model, we measure the free surface height. Notice that at the starting point it's 16 inches in the prototype just like up here and the model since it's half scale it starts at 8 inches. So the first thing we're asked to do is plot on the same graph the height data as a function of time for both the model and the prototype and then set uh, do a dimensional analysis of this given that the height is a function of the initial height, the, con the container diameter, the hole diameter, gravity, and time and then replot on the same graph the height data as a function of time in dimensionless form. So part A or part one of this is pretty straightforward. We just basically plot this data. We, we have time and we plot the height as a function of that time and we do it for both of these. And we just put it on the same plot. So I've already done that and here's what it would look like. The prototype is here. It starts at 16 inches and you can see it's decreasing with time until it empties after a minute. And then the model is given here. It starts at 8 inches because it's a half scale model. And you see it takes um, less time to discharge. So two separate curves as you might expect. So now what we want to do is do a dimensional analysis. Ultimately what our goal here is, is after doing the dimensional analysis and we replot the data in dimensionless form, um, we'll see how the, the data looks in that case. Okay. So for our dimensional analysis, we'll follow our standard procedure. Um, we have the we write down the functional relationship uh, for the uh, dimensional quantity. So the height is a function of capital H, capital D, little d, gravitational acceleration, and time. We were told that that's what that height depends on. We don't know what this function is. Actually, the way you'd get that function is you'd you'd just kind of do a curve fit to the data here and try to empirically find it, or at least do some other analyses like a Bernoulli, Bernoulli equation kind of analysis. But we're pretending we don't, we don't know that, so we're just leaving it as a function. Step two is we're going to write out the basic dimensions for each parameter. So for the height, that's just a length. The initial height is also a length. The container diameter is a length. The hole diameter is a length. Gravitational acceleration is a length over time squared, and time, of course, just time. So you can see that uh, we only need two basic dimensions to describe everything here, just a length and a time. Gravity has both of them in there. Okay, step three of our dimensional analysis approach is to determine the number of pi terms using the Buckingham pi theorem. So the number of pi terms, or dimensionless terms, is equal to the number of variables in our original expression minus the number of reference dimensions required to describe those variables. So the number of variables that we're starting with is given right up right up here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six variables. And the number of reference dimensions to describe those variables will be two because we need a length, certainly and it's clear we need a time independently, and the gravity has both of those already, so, so we really only need two reference dimensions, a length and a time. So we should expect to have four dimensionless terms. All right, so then we need to determine what those dimensionless terms are using the method of repeating variables. So we need to choose uh, repeating variables to make all the other variables dimensionless by the number of repeating variables is equal to the number of reference dimensions. So we'll need two repeating variables. So choose two 
repeating variables. Again, two of them because we have two reference dimensions. And the two that I'll choose here, will I'll just choose the initial height L, and I'll also choose gravitational acceleration. This step is not unique. Different people may choose different repeating variables. What should be unique, however, is the number of pi terms. Everyone should have four. And the number of repeating variables should be two, because it's, it's the same as the number of reference dimensions. That, that's unique. Everybody should have those same variables. The other thing is that those repeating variables should include um, the dimensions required to make everything else dimensionless. So the h has a length, so I'll be I'll, I'll be able to use that h to get rid of the dimensions for you know little h capital D little d, and then I need something with a time in it, and so I chose g here because that has a time in it, and and I can use that time to get rid of the time here for the for the actual time t, little t. But you may have chosen a different set of repeating variables. Maybe you used little d, for example, instead of h. It's totally fine. This part is not unique. So step five is to make all of the non-repeating variables dimensionless using the repeating variables. So for example, pi 1 will involve eight little h. I'm just working my way through my list here, so I'll start with little h. So I'll take little h, multiply it by repeating variable number one raised to the a power, repeating variable number two raised to the b power, and then we want to find what the a and b are required to make that dimensionless. So the dimensions on the pi term will be like the length and time each raised to the zero power, because when you raise something to the zero power it's just equal to one, so it's dimensionless. The dimensions of little h are just length, Dimensions of capital H would be length, but that's raised to the a power. And the dimensions of G are length over time squared raised to the b power here. Let me gather terms. So for the lengths, I have a zero in the exponent here, and that'll be equal to one because of this length. You know, L by itself is just like L to the one, plus an a plus a b. Do the same thing for time. I have a zero on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, it's just a minus 2b. You can see minus 2b because we have a 2 in the denominator here, you know, t raised to the second power here, and then that's raised to the b power. So that'd be like a minus 2b for the exponent on the t. So here you quickly see that b is equal to 0, and then a is equal to minus 1, and what we're left with then is pi 1 will be little h over capital H. We could have done that by observation. We know that the dimensions of little h are just uh, length, and if we're going to make it dimensionless using uh, this capital H, which also has a length, it's just simply dividing little h by capital H. It's, it's very simple. You see that it's a length over a length, so they cancel out. And we can do the same thing for a bunch of other pi terms. So if we move on to the next non-repeating variable, capital D, you see it's also a length, so that second pi term will just be d over capital H. And just to note that I, I understand what I'm doing here, I'll just say by inspection. Because I I need to give at least, I need to communicate to someone else how I figured this out. And you can just look at it that it's it's a length over a length again. So I'm just going to say I, I figured it out by inspection rather than going through the the tedious method of repeating variables approach. So there's my pi 2. Pi 3 will involve the little d. That's also just a length, so it's length over length. Also by inspection, we just see it's length over length. And then we have one last pi term, and that's or one last um, non-repeating variable. That's the little t here. That one I'll actually go through the... Let me give myself a little more space here. Okay, so that one I'll actually go through the method of repeating variables, so you can see that. So the pi 4 term will involve time, and then we have h to the a and g to the b. So the dimension, putting this all in terms of dimensions, we have length to the 0, t to the 0 on the left-hand side. Here 
uh, dimensions of little t are just time, so that's like t to the one. Then we have a length to the a, and we have a length over time squared to the b. Then we'll gather terms. So for the length terms, we have zero on the left-hand side. We have an a plus b on the right-hand side. So again, zero here. There's an a and a length to the b there. And then for the time, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a zero on the left-hand side. We have a one minus two b on the right-hand side. So here's our one there. And then the minus two b is because it's time squared in the denominator raised to the b power. So when we look at this, you'll see that b is equal to one half, and then that means, oops, I just jumped way too far. Okay, and then you combine these two together and you'll get that a is equal to minus one half. So then our pi four term will be t h to the one half times g to the, oops, I'm sorry, h to the minus one half g to the one half. So it'll just look like pi four is t times the square root of g over h. So that's my pi four term. Now step, um, step six of our process is to verify that all of our pi terms are indeed dimensionless. So we've already done that for the first three pi terms. They're all just length over length. So we've we verified those are dimensionless, so that's good. So let's just verify that this one is dimensionless. So that's kind of like a time times the square root, length over time squared, divided by a length. So you'll see here that these lengths cancel out, and we're left with time all over the square root of time squared, and then that'll clearly cancel out. So this one is in fact dimensionless also. Don't skip this step. You know, verifying that the terms are dimensionless is an important part and it'll help you catch any little mistakes you may have made in, um, in step five. Okay, so we just did step six. So step seven is to rewrite the expression in terms of our dimensionless variables. So it'll look like little h over, so it's pi one is a function of the other pi terms. So little h over capital H is a function of d over capital H, little d over capital H times t over square root of g over h. So that's our expression written in dimensionless form. Remember that we started with little h looks like this. So that was our starting expression in dimensional form. You can see we had six variables. The function again, we don't really know what it is. I just call it f1 here. But if we do, if we write this equation just in dimensionless form, it's the same kind of equation, it's just rearranged. It'll look like this. Instead of having six dimensional terms, we actually have four dimensionless terms. The function is different in general. Because we've rearranged the terms, um, the function will, will look a little different, but that's fine. We, we don't know what these functions are. We'd find them experimentally or through some other analysis. Dimensional analysis does not give you what the function looks like. But anyway, our, our expression is a little more simple because we now have four variables instead of six. So now the very last part of the problem was to, to replot our data in terms of these dimensionless quantities. So the since we're dealing with um, a model that's half scale, so okay, so let me just kind of explain what it is I'm doing here. For this part of the problem, part three, we're asked to, to replot the height data as a function of time, but using dimensionless form. So instead of using h, I want to use my dimensionless, I want to, I want to replot this using my dimensionless h over capital H. And I'll do the same thing over here for the prototype data. Instead of little h, I'll use little h over capital H. And then instead of time, I want to use my dimensionless time, which will be t times the square root of g over capital H. And I'll do the same thing over here. So what I would need to do is re, you know, calculate this data using, you know, so so make a new like if this was in a spreadsheet, I'd make a new column with h over capital H. So it would start off with a value of one, and then this one would be like seven eighths, etc. Right? 
Same sort of thing over here. I'd have another column with little h over capital H. This would be a value of 1. This would also be 7 eighths, etc. It would be like 14 over 16, which is 7 eighths. And then I'd do the same thing for the time. In a spreadsheet, I would just make a new column, t times g over capital H, square root of that. And I would just calculate, I would take this t there, multiply by uh, square root of 9.81, and divide through by the square root of 8, because that's my, my initial it's my initial height. And then I would just calculate what those numbers are. And I would do the same thing over here for the prototype. And then I would plot little h over capital H as a function of the dimensionless time. And I'd do that for both. And just they ask us to do that on the same plot. Okay, so if you do that, what you find, and I've already pre-calculated it, is this. So here's our pi 1 term, our little h over capital H, and here's our pi 4 term, t times the square root of g over h. The other pi terms, the pi 2, which was, I think it was d over capital H, capital D over capital H, and pi 3 was little d over capital H. That's the same that, that pi term is actually constant because we have geometric similarity, meaning that everything is scaled in the same way. So, for example, in the model, or actually, let me start with the prototype. Recall that in the prototype, we're told that capital H was 16 inches, and capital D, let me go back up to the top and find it, so we're told right here the capital H is 16 inches, the capital D is 4, and the little d is 0.25. So we're told that, but we're also told the model is a half scale. So, so the capital H in the model is 8 inches. Capital D in the model will be half scale, so that'll be two inches. And the, the diameter of the hole in the model, sorry, should be half of that, so it should be 0.125 inches. So that when you do the pi term, pi 2, say the diameter of the prototype over h over the prototype, it'll be exactly the same as the diameter of the model over the h of the model. So these, these terms are just constants. These terms right here are just constants because it's geometrically scaled. Every, since that's done by half in the model and that's done by half in the model, it will be the same value as what you'd get for that ratio if it's the prototype. Okay, so anyway, I didn't write that correctly here. This is a pi 4 term. So when we plot our data that look different up here in dimensional form, we got two different curves, but when we make it dimensionless, the two curves actually fall one on top of another in dimensionless form. So we can really um, condense our plot considerably. So if I made a, a one-third scale model or a, a one-fifteenth square model, if I do it all in dimensionless form, it'll all actually, all that data would fall on the same line here. So that's one of the nice things about dimensional analysis is that you can more compact com, you can present your data in a more compact form and because the data tends to collapse when presented in dimensionless form. All right, hopefully uh, hopefully that, that all makes sense. Um, again, you want to take a look at some of the other examples so you can see how I apply dimensional analysis to different situations. So we'll go ahead and end there.